but you know, and he's also interested if you've got any questions and so I, yeah, so today I didn't we didn't have a topic, so we just it's open open discussion. I, I just thought of some ideas right now. If you guys have any questions, um, good to see you. We got a few new people. Welcome. I'm only here once a year, so it's easy to be new. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For me. Um, so let's see here, just some ideas. In times, in, t in years past, we've talked about, I think, um, how to talk to your doctor, yep. um, certain disease processes such as strokes. I think yes. we talked about end of life care, uh, uh, healthcare proxies, um, things like code status. We've talked about. Um, you talked about what to expect upon admission. Yeah, what happens in the acute care hospital if you get admitted to the hospital? And we've talked about discharge planning, mm -hmm. the discharge planning. One point I remember even having a good discussion about sleep habits. <laughs> That's a, which of course none of us have any problems sleeping at night. Uh -huh. <laughs> so well, just uh, yeah. just as a point of caution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll come over here in the corner. So, so, um, so I, I work mostly in the post-acute care area. So you guys, you guys know that um, uh, we, my little group, we're based in Boxford over the animal hospital, and we're in 13 SNFs, which are skilled nursing facilities. They used to be called nursing homes, but they don't like being called nursing homes anymore because there's a lot more rehab that goes on. People are getting discharged to the SNFs um, much sicker than they used to, and uh, where people might stay in the hospital for five or 10 days in the past, now they're staying for three or four days, and then they're going straight to the SNFs or, or you know, to the long-term acute care hospitals and such. Can I, um, can I just, I should interrupt and just mm -hmm. explain again, if, since we have a few new people. This is Dan Tallman, who's been a very good friend and, and a wonderful speaker for us for several years, so I'm very grateful, because I know you've got a really nice, the, the schedule's even picked up for you, so it's really nice that, you know, when you, I'm happy to come. come. Join us. I like to smell the food that yeah. I can't eat because I'm Because <laughs> even I can remember again when he started speaking with us, his kids were, were, were little kids. Yeah, this was about 10 years ago. Yeah. I've been yeah. going for about 10 years. Yes, you have. Yeah. So it's fun. And some of us didn't even have children, grandchildren at that point. Yeah. I do now. So, but, so I'm really, thank you. I really appreciate taking the time and <coughs> it's been a great resource for us. Yeah. And yeah. next month, in June, Jim Lacey is going to come and talk about the work at Camp Denison. Oh, you know, and I thought, you know, I said, bring photos, bring work, and of course, you might try to recruit a few people for some additional uh -huh. volunteers. But I mean, that's been a tremendous effort out there, and I thought you know, that would be a nice, you know, opportunity to uh, to talk about all the progress that they've made, and, and the volunteer effort out there has been tremendous. Mm -hmm. All uh, all that's been accomplished by just those mm -hmm. the, the group of bobs. Mm -hmm. But Dan, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, so we're you know, I could even write down my notes or. or oh, I'm, I like writing. I, you know, I you guys know I like to draw pictures. I'm a big picture person. They're ugly <laughs> pictures, but they're they're hopefully uh, you can I'm see what they're bring, meant to and be. And I'll bring out more French toast. Um, so uh, some things that we were talking. So in years past, we've talked about a variety of things. Um, some ideas that I thought um, sometimes medications. Some people ask medication questions. You know, why am I on this? My son's on this. My kid's on this. My you know, my wife's on this, what, what is that, what does it do? Uh, basic medical science, we could talk about, you know, what's a bacteria, what's a virus, um, you know, probiotics, <coughs> what's a heart attack, what's atrial fibrillation, what is uh, COPD or diabetes, uh, different types of infections, uh, you know, what's a stroke, things like that, falls, vertigo, lightheadedness, um, vision problems, uh, primary care problems. I'm, I work in the SNFs, so I'm not a good, what I do is try to fix people's problems after they have a problem. It's not so much primary prevention. So if you guys have questions about what's the best diet to decrease this risk or that risk, that's really not my area of expertise. That's probably what your PCP is going to be better at. Because a good PCP, a good visit is a boring visit. A good doctor visit is super boring. You know, you're doing everything right, you have no problems, and you're eating everything the way you're supposed to and doing some exercise and, and whatever. But so the PCP's job is to try to keep you from getting sick. And then my job is once people are sick, do what do we can do to kind of get them tuned up and ready to go home. Um, so I'm happy to take the, any questions, but uh, you know, it may not be the best answers. Um, levels of care, we can always talk. Um, I've worked, uh, we have, I have a practice, I have a colleague who's in practice in assisted livings as a primary care, she's a nurse practitioner. Um, so there's assisted living practice model that we have. Um, we take care of people in the acute care hospital, in the long-term care acute, 
hospital at Lydia Bradford, that's what's called an LTAC. That's actually a hospital level of care. Uh, LTAC has a transitional care unit, it's called a TCU. Um, we work in skilled nursing facilities. Uh, those are what used to be called nursing homes. We've got short-term short -term rehab patients and long-term care. So um, the long-term care people that live there. Uh, I, I'm a hospice, I'm a hospice uh, medical director. So we could talk about what, what is hospice, what is palliative care. That, that would be an interesting discussion. Um, and um, also uh, VNA, visiting nurses, like what exactly do they do and all that stuff. Um, so anything that's interesting or not interesting of the above or whatever you guys have any questions about, I have to leave at 10.25, so we've got about 30, 35 minutes here. But I'm a big talker. Awesome. Thank you. If you guys get anything going, give me anything. I'll go with it. When do you think there's a need for hospice care? Okay, so hospice care is for the definition by Medicare regulations is that normally your disease process would uh, normally you would be have passed away within six months. So most so your primary care doctor has to certify that they would expect under normal circumstances that you would be you'd be dead in six months. Um, the uh, most hospice patients come on board way too late. They come on board and they die the same day or they die three days later or seven days later. Um, we do have some people who stay on for a year or a year and a half and what happens in hospice, what happens in hospice is we have a meeting every two months on everybody and we have to recertify that we're doing something that the patient qualifies for hospice. So um, the hospice has like chaplains, they've got um, aides that come and, and uh, you, you know, uh, both volunteers that basically just hang around and chat and you know, just volunteers. They've also got paid medical assistants that can help with uh, medical care. Um, they've got nurses, RN nurses that come to evaluate your meds to make sure people are comfortable. Um, the goal of hospice is really to make sure people are comfortable and dignified. It's not to fix people up. It's not to get you tuned up enough to, to you know, for the next lap. So that's important to know because we're all going to pass away at some point. And I think most of us don't want to be in the hospital if we can avoid it. But we don't want to be in pain. And we don't want to be laying there naked with everybody walk, traipsing in and out. So I think that, that that's a, a valuable service and something that is worth looking into. Um, people do graduate from hospice. So it doesn't have to be the, um, you know, I think people are scared to talk about hospice, but um, I think doctors, primary care doctors may or may not be, the hospice conversation can be a long conversation. Uh, so it's something that's kind of harder for the doc to, to address in, a, in an office. If you come into the office and you've got six problems, you know, this hurts and I've got this and I'm short of breath and I've got this rash and there's this thing on my, you know, can you burn this thing off? It's going to be harder for them to talk about that. So it's, it's worth going and seeing your doc or your nurse practitioner for a visit just about like, how am I doing overall? What's the big picture here? Because they would be happy to have that conversation. Um, and as I've talked in times past, if you go to your primary care doctor, they really only have time to talk about two or three things. So if you go with ten problems, make three appointments. You know, just make three appointments because they'll love to see you. That's how they make money. They make money by seeing you. So come on back every two weeks. And probably most of you guys are retired, so why not go visit the doctor, you know? I had a six-month follow-up with my PCP yesterday, and uh, I went in to go see the nurse practitioner. I'd never seen her before. And uh, I, I didn't even know why I was coming back, but I had made a, my PCP said, you know, why don't you come back in six months? We'll check on this and that and whatever. So I made my appointment, and I had it on my schedule. And then um, they, uh, they, uh, you know, any problems? I'm like, no, not, not really. I mean, but they found things to talk to me about, you know, a variety of different things. So sometimes it's good to go as just a routine follow-up because they'll, they'll find things to, to help kind of tune up and, and work with you on. So, so hospice, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing. You can do hospice in the uh, skilled nursing facility or the hospital or in your house. So hospice can be done anywhere. Um, some hospices, there are financial implications. If you're in a hospice, in a, you, you, they, you should find out about that <clears throat> ahead of time. Because um, sometimes hospice pays for some things and doesn't pay for other things. And sometimes you might get on the hook for a payment 
for something in one setting level of care, but not in something else. So that's that's a legit question to ask about. Because people, docs can do hospice stuff in any, in any level of care, but you'll get more hospice attention if you're actually enrolled in hospice. You'll get more, you, you, you won't get a chaplain. Like if, you, if, you're, if you're in the hospital and you've chosen, I, I don't want any more stuff. Let, let me, you know, I'm gonna probably, you know, die in the next two or three days. Let me just stay here in the hospital. Um, we can keep people comfortable and dignified in the hospital, but you're not gonna get a social worker to come in and talk to the family about end of life planning. You're not gonna get, you know, somebody, chaplain and volunteers and things like that. So there's, they do more uh, support for the family. Cause you also gotta think about it from your family's perspective. Cause then there's somebody to talk about them about planning you know what your wishes are um, afterwards and are they okay and you know oh the son doesn't get along with the daughter and they're arguing about this like sometimes it's nice to have somebody else who can get in between that whole thing so that's my opinion on hospice palliative care now palliative care means uh, talking about the goals of care <clears throat> so somebody who's been in the hospital five times let's say somebody's been in the hospital five times in a year something's not going right something is very wrong with with your health so they might ask for a palliative care consult and what that is is that there's a specialty palliative care and they they talk about what are your goals how aggressive do you want to be because doctoring we can keep people going for quite a while we can keep people trundling along humans are tough and we have a lot of things that we can do to keep people going for a while the question is is that what you want if you're unconscious intubated in the ICU for two weeks and you're gonna die anyway is that what's the point of that like because it's probably uncomfortable i mean I'm, i've never had anybody say oh that was no big deal like that's easy i'll do that again um so then that's that's important to know people who who want i, I mean and and it's better to plan ahead if somebody's going to have breathing problems over and over again maybe it's time to get a, a trait you know it, as because it's much more comfortable to have a trait some people as people age and get sick you have a problem swallowing it's very common uh, you can choke, get pneumonia, things like that. Sometimes, maybe it's a good idea to get a G-tube, a tube where it goes straight in your stomach. Um, that sounds like a huge production and a big giant deal. It really isn't a big giant deal. And if that is the one thing that's going to keep you going, let's say you've had a stroke and you can't swallow, but you've got five or 10 or 20 more years of, of life ahead of you and you've got grandkids and you've got stuff to do. If that is your one problem and your main risk in life, then you should talk about that with a, with a palliative care doc because there are a lot of misconceptions out there about lots of things, about what we can do and what we can't do. I think most people think that when you die, you just die like that, and it's really not that way normally. Um, so, and I think a lot of, yeah, so, you know, in the movies, everybody, they talk, 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 and then, and then they die like that. That's not usually how it goes. And it just doesn't go that way. So. Uh, you know, it's good to talk to people who can kind of set expectations and not, um, and, and get to know what you guys want, or any patient, or your wife, or your, you know, some kid who's got cancer, or something like that. So, that's what I think about hospice and palliative care. You want to talk about miracle, medical marijuana? Medical marijuana. I like miracle better. <laughs> um, so, medical marijuana, um, not my area of expertise. Um, uh, marijuana, uh, THC, uh, tetrahydrocannabinoid or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one of the active ingredients. Um, it's not approved by the federal government, so we can't use it in, in skilled nursing facilities. So you're not going to get any THC uh, medical marijuana in a sniff or in any kind of a hospital or anything. Um, there is something called Marinol, which is it's got some sort of uh, bioequivalent to, to mar marijuana and it makes you hungry. That's one way that we do use uh, kind of an equivalent in, in the hospital is Marinol. That stimulates your appetite for people who are uh, losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. Um, uh, as far as marijuana, I went to a talk about two or three years ago and the, I think the leading experts in the state were generally against it. I think doctors are generally, generally mildly against it. Um, I do know that there are, reportedly, there are many positive uses. I think it decreases uh, pain, medication need. I think it decreases nausea, certainly. It stimulates appetite, for sure. 
um, it is much, much less addictive than most, much less addictive than alcohol or, or nicotine, for instance, um, and less addictive than heroin and cocaine and such. Um, I also have heard that uh, people who use marijuana, either legally or illegally, um, use less narcotics, and uh, marijuana is much, much safer. If you're going to have a, if you're going to have a bad, if you're going to have an illegal bad habit, I mean, now it's not legal, but if you're going to have a problem, it's better to have marijuana be your problem than heroin or using oxycodone. So um, I'm not, I don't uh, prescribe marijuana. Um, it's not, I'm not morally opposed to it. I just don't know enough about it. And it would be like prescribing an e-cigarette as opposed to cigarette. I'm not morally opposed to e-cigarettes. I just don't know enough about them to say you should use that. I mean, <coughs> theoretically, it should be better than a cigarette because you've got a lot of carcinogens, you've got a lot of smoke, you've got, you got um, you know, oils and things that are burning up in all kinds of bad ways in a cigarette. So, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm mildly anti, but not, you know, my, I, could, I could be convinced otherwise. And, and it's just because I just don't have time to look things up. So, so if anybody else has more uh, knowledge, I'd, I'd be happy to hear it. But usually when people tell me things, I say thank you for your information, and I look it up like in depth in great detail. Because one thing I've also learned is that when you talk to people about rules or laws or this is how we do things or this is why we do things, it's always a good idea at least to go look things up and educate yourself in as much detail as you can. Because I've had nursing home directors tell me this is how we do things because that's what corporate says or that's what our corporate lawyer says or that's, what, that's how it's done, that's the rule. And I respectfully say, thank you very much, I'll go look it up myself. And 50% of the time, I find out that if you look at the rules and the laws, they're not exactly what they say. They may imply some of these things, but they're not exact. And so uh, I think there's great value in looking things up in detail before you go. What's the criteria to be a hospice? In other words, if you're in a hospital, you've got great hospital care. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a great hospital care as opposed to uh, hospice? Who, how do you determine? So, um, so hospice, so you have to have six month life expectancy, normally. A normal person with your problems would, would be, would, most people would expire within six months. That's number one, have to be within six months. Hospice has about 10 or 15 diagnoses that they're allowed to admit for. Um, so they can admit, and, and they're, you know, they're different types of dementia that you can admit for, that's, that's pretty common. Uh, end-stage COPD, which is pulmonary disease, emphysema. You can admit for end-stage congestive heart failure, different types of, any type of cancer where you've got a documented and pretty reasonable expectation of, of dying. Um, but, you know, some things just like failure to thrive, like somebody's 103 years old and they're just losing weight. So if you're losing 10% of your body weight every, I think it's 10% every six months, then you can qualify for hospice also. So if you're losing 10% of your body weight every six months and we just don't know why, I mean, at 103 or 112, you know, people just kind of wind down. So maybe they're getting weaker and they need, they need some support and they would qualify for hospice. Um, uh, that would be a good admission. Oh. Uh, can you close that other door also? Um, the, uh, the reason to stay in a hospital is acuity of care. So if you're in an acute care hospital, the reason is because you've got an acute issue. And one of the, the, the major things that you do in an acute care hospital that you don't do other places is uh, the rapidity of diagnosis. If I need x-rays fast or labs fast, or I need intense, like the nurse to patient ratio is higher in an acute care hospital. So when I say acute care hospital, I just mean a regular old hospital. Like what, what you guys would think of a hospital? Because um, there are other types of hospital too. So um, if you have some issue that is so overwhelmingly hard to take care of that you need to be in a hospital, then you can be in a hospital. And you can get hospice care in a hospital. If you still need hospice care after a day or two, you haven't died, they would be likely to send you to what's called a hospice house. Hospice houses, there's one in uh, Haverhill, and there's one down in like Danvers or, or someplace like that. Danvers. Yeah, Danvers. And, um, and those, are, those are for people who need a lot of nursing care. Those people are in bad shape and they would not be able to be taken care of in, um, in a home. And usually, in order to admit to the hospice house, in general, I think the life expectancy has to be 10 days or less. Um, but I do know that people can stay longer. But generally, you have to say we would expect about 10 days. And that's people who are bleeding a lot, who've got lots of wounds, lots, of, tons of pain, like that kind of thing. So you can take care of people on hospice in the hospital, but it's more the acuity of care. 
And in the hospital, the nurses aren't hospice nurses. You're going to get better hospice care at the hospice house. And most people who have on hospice, if they're, you know, either the patient or the family, if possible, generally like to have them at home if possible, if you can, if you can make it work. So mm -hmm. a follow-up, if you're lucid and you're in a hospice care, if you're mm -hmm. lucid mm -hmm. and make a decision, if you say, I, don't want, I want to be made comfortable, mm -hmm. uh, how do they... They give you enough painkillers, but they don't give you any support. Is that it? You Morphine. Just, you'll, you'll just uh, pass away quicker, right? So let's say you're in the hospital. Are you talking about hospital or just hospice in general? Hospice in general. Okay. So hospice in general. Let's say that you've got um, uh, cancer. You're with it. You are with it, and you've got cancer, and you're losing weight, and you're in pain because you've got pancreatic cancer, and it's, it's burning up your stomach, and it's eating through, and it's in your bones, and you're, it's metastatic, and you've got pain everywhere. So... Now, in the past, you were on high blood pressure medicine. We don't need that. Like, we don't need any more high blood. If your blood pressure is 180 over 100, you're not going to die of that. The reason why we keep blood pressure low is so people don't have strokes and heart attacks, yes. But also, years down the line, it reduces your risk of heart attack in the future. So preventing badness is something we do in medicine. But once you're in hospice, like, we don't have to worry about your cholesterol, right? But we would keep you on your laxatives, because who wants to be constipated when you're dying? Especially now you're going to be getting lots of pain meds, which cause constipation and confusion. So on hospice, we would stop things like cholesterol. Traditionally, we would stop things like cholesterol meds, aspirin, like aspirin, aspirin, to de decrease heart risk and stroke. Um, we would stop things like um, if you had so, it, it, vitamins, multivitamins. So I think what you're saying, if I hear you right, they won't try to maintain your life expectancy, but they will try to keep you comfortable. Absolutely, so, yeah. Okay. So if sleep is, if pain is your problem, we can help you out. We can fix you I'm up. I'm asking this. I have a friend who's uh, he weighed, he's calling him 260. Now he's down to 134 pounds. And he's been going through radiation and chemotherapy for three and a half years. Mm -hmm and he had a tumor removed in his stomach. Mm -hmm. I hardly recognized him when I went to see him. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's what they're doing. They're trying to keep him comfortable. So they're not giving him any uh, life support right. to do things. Yeah, so radiation, you can, you, like in hospice, you can get radiation if it makes you comfortable. If you have an obstructing cancer in your lung or in your intestines or something and it's obstructing forward movement of food or you can't breathe, they'll give you palliative radiation to decrease the size of that cancer, cancer so that you're more comfortable. So it's not like you can't get chemo or can't get radiation, but people kind of decide on what they want and what they don't want because those things can be uncomfortable. Chemo can make you nauseous and just feel generally bad. Um, uh, radiation, you can get burns and it can be uncomfortable. You can have side effects from, from radiation also. Um, so hospice is you know comfort and dignity. That's what it's all about. Um, people, family members, we do have family members that say, boy, you know, mom really, really wants to stay on her Coumadin for her AFib, but she's on hospice. And for me as a doc, your general risk of a stroke in AFib is about 3% a year on no, now that's about, it depends. The more risk factors you have, the higher your risk. If you've got cancer, your risk is higher of a stroke. So maybe it's 5% per year. So let's say mom has three months, you know, let's say mom is looking bad and she might have a month or two left. And uh, you want, um, so I would say as an hospice doc, why, why put her on Coumadin? Because we have to check her, check her INR, we have to poke you. That's another pain thing that we're doing to you. And we're not really extending your life that much. It's two months. Your risk of having a, your 5% your, your annual risk of having a stroke in the next two months is, you know, 0.6%. Okay, and let's say you did have a stroke. Okay, I mean, she's dying of something, and she had a stroke. I mean, at some point, you're just dying. Like, whatever you die of, that's what you're going to die of something, and it's going to happen in the near future. So family members can override. Uh, they can give us their wishes, and, and we'll go for it. Um, now, that type of thing, though, that would be where the family has to pay for Coumadin, which is very inexpensive, but there are other meds that are more expensive. We do have family members who want their family members to be on Coumadin or, um, you know, a variety of things. Like, yeah, so you can, you can demand to stay on certain meds, but most, in general, the, the medical uh, director of the hospice company will say, we would recommend stopping these five meds, continuing these five, and we'll give you extra. And then you've got, at home, you, they would have a kit with like morphine 
and uh, anti-nausea meds and things like that. Or morphine or not morphine, like oxycodone pills, if you could swallow pills, that kind of thing. Is hospice a 24-7? Yeah, absolutely. You call hospice, those, those people will be out there. They're not there at your side 24-7, but they're there. Um, they'll come out, if you are looking bad, they will come out anytime, 24-7. Those nurses are amazing. They, they get out there and they, they are dedicated. Um, the, the, you know, you've got volunteers, so they're not going to be there 24-7. You've got the chaplain who goes around and some people want to talk to the chaplain, some don't. You've got a social worker um, and then you've got medical assistants. And if your problem is at night, you've got major problems at night and you're, you know, whatever. They can put people on overnight, uh, but generally it's not 24-7, but it can be pretty, pretty uh, you know, intense, um, especially as, as people are really at the end of life, you know, they can really up, you know, turn up the, turn up the heat on that, or the gain, or the volume, or whatever you want to say, turn up the tension, so. So, any meds? Who's on, who's, who's got a cousin, or a nephew, or a niece, or a wife, or somebody that's on a strange med that you're, any questions about? Or stroke, what's a stroke, what's a heart attack? What's, what's anything? There's two types of strokes. Yep, what's it's the difference ischemic and hemorrhagic. So 85% of strokes are clotting strokes, and 15% and of strokes are bleeding strokes. So, um, so the first thing that happens when you go to the hospital is they do a quick CAT scan. A CAT scan with no contrast, <laughs> because CT scans, uh, um, CT scans, which is computed tomography. Uh, so a CT scan uh, will, is able to see blood very, very, very well. And it also sees calcium, so it sees bones well. So if you're looking for a fracture or something like that, CT scan is the way to go. If you're looking for blood, CT scan is great. It's a great way to go. So the first thing they do is put you in the CAT scanner quickly to see if you've got a bleeding stroke. Because if you have a bleeding stroke, you don't want to cause more bleeding by giving them something that causes bleeding. But 85% of people have clotting strokes, so uh, the treatment initially of most strokes is going to be giving you something that is a thrombolytic, it, it breaks down the clots, or it's an antiplatelet medicine or something like that. Um, if you present within two hours, and right now they're changing the, the guidelines as, as far as how far out they can give you these meds that, that help with anti-clotting, I think that they're going from like two hours to three hours right now. Because what happens is if, if you give somebody, if, if all of a sudden, Right now, somebody has symptoms that are consistent with a stroke, and they go to the hospital, and it's been, we know when it started, they can give you this clot buster, and it can, it, can, it can fix you up, it can cure you, but it can also cause bleeding in other places. What happens to the clot? Is it, if it gets into the lung, you'll have an embolism, right? Well, so um, your clotting cascade in your body, if you think of it like a uh, teeter-totter, that's really how you should think about it, because we're constantly clotting, everywhere and then we're, we're, we're breaking down those clots all the time so it, it's a balance so when you take aspirin or you take a little bit of Coumadin or whatever it is that you're taking it just alters the balance a bit um, and you we can we can alter the balance a lot by giving you subcutaneous heparin or things like that we can we can make the balance change significantly immediately but um, when you're taking pills in general it's to change the balance to some degree because you're at more risk of most people are at risk of clotting most people would be taking aspirin a day aspirin is very common um, the the clot so you've got different types of clots also the clots that you have in your brain are generally um, they're going to be either your arteries are slowly closing because as we eat more cholesterol and age uh, calcium and fat kind of and, and glucose if you've got diabetes the sugar gets in there and sugar is like literally sticky in your bloodstream if you've got uh, you know too much calcium too much too many platelets sticky blood you've got cancer you've got some reason to be hypercoagulable you've got diabetes you're going to be getting more and more clot buildup in your arteries until they they get too small so the aspirin help for that yes aspirin would help for that um, what if, happens if you're allergic to aspirin? Then you wouldn't take aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you can take? Yeah. You can take Plavix. You can take, take what? Uh, Plavix is something that is uh, works similarly to aspirin. So aspirin works on the platelets. The, most, the, the two most common ways that your body clots are with platelets or with uh, the, the, the serum, the, the liquid, the clear liquid that you'll see sometimes in your blood, that's called serum, plasma. 
And uh, that has the intrinsic, so there's fiber in there that's, that's floating around. And if you activate these uh, cascades, the fiber can, can glom together and create a sticky, a sticky mesh that then the platelets come in and stick in on, and then you get a, a scap. Or you know, if you cut yourself, it'll bleed for a bit and then it'll stop. So the, the aspirin or Plavix work on the platelet side, and then you've got heparin and Lovenox and, and other types of, of medications, both injectable and oral pills, that work on the, 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 the pathway that's in, the, um, in, your, in your serum. The answer to your question about clots in the brain, though, is that there are different types of strokes. There are many different types of strokes. Um, one type of stroke is where an artery just closes off. It just it's, it closes off, and then you get a stroke in a water in that area. So that's one kind of stroke, and that's that's not uncommon. Um, that kind of stroke, uh, it may respond to a clot buster. That that's a that's a good one that will respond. That may or may not respond to a clot buster. If you go in and they see that it's the kind of stroke, they can actually go in and put stents in certain arteries if they're big enough. Now, at the base of your at the base of your brain, there's something called the circle of Willis, and you've got four arteries, four big arteries uh, the, the, uh, that go that, that go up and 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 allow your blood to circulate through so that you get good di distribution to your whole uh, your brain. So if you've got a big arterial problem, sometimes the, uh, you can go uh, use a stent to open it up, or you've got your, your natural, uh, you know, your carotid arteries and, and such uh, that, that feed this circle of Willis. Um, you've got other kinds of uh, clot, you've got other kinds of strokes. Um, um, you can have a bleed, the, another kind of clotting stroke would be atrial fibrillation. People with atrial fibrillation get clots in their uh, left atrium. Um, because it's not beating correctly and the blood uh, sits there and just coagulates in the, uh, there's a little appendage on the left atrium. So back it up a little bit. If you have a clot. Mm -hmm. A true clot will probably be a fib. A true clot in the brain. It's probably you a take fib. a 325 milligram of aspirin. Mm -hmm. what, what, will it, what will that do for you if anything at all? Um, <laughs> so when your body sees a clot that's not supposed to be there, it starts to break it down. So your body is gonna see this clot in your brain and say, this is not where this clot's supposed to be. And it's gonna start breaking it down. So if you give, if you give aspirin, then that can help break down this, this clot uh, more quickly. Um, aspirin uh, permanently disables the platelets that it's on. So when you take an aspirin, it stays in your bloodstream for about eight days. Um, aspirin, aspirin, aspirin. Not aspirin, Tylenol, not aspirin, ibuprofen, aspirin, aspirin. Bayer aspirin. Any, yeah, Bayer aspirin, aspirin, aspirin. Because a lot of people call aspirin a lot of things, like anything that's a pill that, that takes away fever is aspirin. So I'm talking aspirin, aspirin. Um, the platelets that it touches, it disables those platelets for good, but your body's constantly making platelets, and the uh, natural turnover for all your platelets is about eight days. So if I took an aspirin today, uh, later today, tomorrow, I would have the maximum effect, and then every day after that would be lower. And 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 that 81 milligram aspirin that I'm taking doesn't doesn't affect all my platelets. I still have some platelet function, but it's less. Um, so if I take an 81, so if you have a stroke, and you don't get there within either you're not a candidate for a TPA, that's the uh, clot buster. If you're not a candidate for that because you came in too late or it's the wrong kind of stroke, but they give you an aspirin, they might give you an 81 milligram aspirin. On initially because you've had one stroke and they don't want okay yeah. and they might make sure your blood pressure is under control you don't have diabetes your cholesterol is under control and even if it's under control they might give you a low-level cholesterol medicine just so to get if you lower. Have a bleeding no so aspirin for you you took aspirin to the condition. it would be worse yeah yeah, yeah exactly so uh, so clotting strokes you can have endocarditis which are infected clots from the heart those are pretty uncommon uh, yeah, pretty uncommon. You could have atrial fibrillation that causes clots. You can have arteries that just close down from high, high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, bad circulation. Um, uh, there is a comp, you know, I can't remember what kind, but as your brain ages, you have a more, you're also more predisposed to just having spontaneous bleeds in, in the actual, in the brain itself also. Those are, those are kind of not, not uh, good to have because uh, they, re they can recur over and over again. And then in the bleeding in the bleeding stroke category, you can just have bleeding strokes uh, from you know intraparenchymal, like I was talking about, where where it just bleeds into the actual part of the brain. If you fall, you can have subdural hematomas. You can have uh, 
uh, uh, bleeds um, of kind of traumatic. Uh, those are easier to fix because you can just drill a hole in your skull cap and drain it out if you get if you get it in time. Yeah, yeah. The neurosurgeons they do a burr hole and and uh, drain those. Is that similar to an aneurysm? So an aneurysm is when you you know how in a uh, a water hose or a tire when it starts getting bulged out as uh, because of the because of physics more advanced than I can tell you. As the bulge gets bigger, the pressure actually gets greater on the weak part. So aneurysms, they'll monitor, doctors will monitor your aneurysm uh, either monthly or every three months or six months or yearly or, or whenever, because as they get bigger, they're at more risk of getting bigger faster. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a slide, you know, initially it's not going fast, not going fast, fast, fast. So, so there's a point at which they say, yes, you need surgery or no, you don't. Um, in, in these, you can have aneurysms anywhere. Um, they're not all catastrophic. They can be, so you should know about those. Uh, they, there's a lot that they can do for a lot of these aneurysms. Some of them they can put little sleeves on the inside that supports this. Sometimes they have to go and do surgery and, and, and uh, cut out part of it and put a, a fake part in. Um, a lot of aneurysms are abdominal aortic aneurysm. And the problem with the abdominal aortic aneurysm is that it's, it's, it's from about here to here. Um, and your, your, your arteries to your kidneys come off of that. So a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes if you fix those, you can have problems with kidney damage because you have problems with that circulation back to your kidneys. But that's all the vascular surgeons, those guys are really good at that. They know the numbers, that's, that's why you go see those people because there's a way, there's a specific number and we're trying to get your blood pressure lower to, to, to decrease the risk of that. So that's very exciting. Yes, sir. Oh, oh wait, here, you've got, you had three questions. What's your question? Okay. Question. Comment. Complaint. He's himself for a doctor as a fool for a doctor. <laughs> That's right. Don't don't treat yourself. So, and and my wife has a saying. There's a saying in German where the uh, the shoemaker's children have the worst shoes. <laughs> yeah, seriously. In in my house, if some like some kid tells me I feel sick, I'm like, you're not you're not sick enough. You're not sick to me. Go to school. I mean, I mean, I don't want them to cough on the other kids, but. You know, they got to be pretty sick not to, you know, to impress me. Yes, sir. I, I had a double injury. Mm hmm. And they caught one in the main over here. Mm hmm. And that solved that. But the other one, I just had to go and pack all around it. And it was up. And it hit 65 and you're doing good. Mm hmm. Well, I'm 83, so I didn't do too bad. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, if you've got an aneurysm, it's this bulge in this, it's this bulge in the tube. So, you uh, and they fix the if the, if they're going to do stenting, if they can't like cut into your brain, then they have to fix it from the inside. So they'll put something on the inside, and then you've still got this bulge on the outside. So they they, they either have to staple it in or wire it in somehow. But you've still got this other bulge that could grow, and I I, I have to think that they they use some method to get it so that it's it, it destroys the outside part that's the aneurysmal part, and and your blood is is circulating through that the new stent. But that's way beyond my area of expertise. Yeah. Oh. My dad had an aneurysm problem as well, and he stayed with most of the whole thing on the ankles. But it's not, the kids is Alzheimer's. Yes, yes, Alzheimer's is bad. So um, abdominal aortic aneurysms are usually catastrophic. People, there aren't a lot of things that will just kill you instantly. You're walking along, minding your own business, and you just keel over dead. Catastrophic strokes, which most aren't. Most strokes aren't like, you don't just kill over dead with most strokes. Usually you have, either it's a mild stroke or, or severe and you have residual deficits. So people who say, I'm just gonna die of a stroke, you know, I'm not gonna treat my high blood pressure, I'm just gonna have a stroke and die. You don't just die like that, you don't just keel over. I mean, I wish people, like, I wish I would just like, when it's time to die, I just die. Um, one second. Yep. Uh, um, the abdominal aortic aneurysms, if they do pop, I mean, it's not like they explode, but they will rip open and then most people who have aneurysms, it's because their arteries are hardened. And, and once your hardened artery opens, it doesn't clot very well and the pressure is pretty high. You do, have, um, you do have fascia and your whole body is around that area. So you can tamponade that off. You, once you lose enough blood, if it, if it can't keep spreading, the blood pressure on the outside is gonna eventually like stop the bleeding. Now, we only have about six liters of blood, so it depends on where it's bleeding. So if it gets into your abdomen, you bleed out, but if it's someplace where it's um, behind the, uh, you know, the, the firmer part of the fascia and such, you could 
it could uh, tampen it off. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not a great way to go. They brought them? They brought it after you died when they operated the table with the back. Yeah, yeah, aneurysms are, are uh, not good. He said he watched the whole thing from the He watched it? He said he watched the whole operation from the scene. Yeah. And, and uh, also, anybody who's got Alzheimer's, anything that puts you, makes you a little sick, will, can tip you over the edge and get you more confused. Um, that's pretty common. Uh, so another thing that people don't realize is that people will, de will compensate until we decompensate. And that's a hard thing for family or for we ourselves to appreciate. Um, if you have um, bad vertigo and you just deal with it, you know, after a while, and, and so the, the way that you can keep your balance is your vision, your proprioceptors, which are nerves in your joints that tell you where you are on earth, um, you know, they're reflexes that keep you up, and also your cerebellum and your, your inner ear. So if you take out the cerebellum, like let's say you've got bad vertigo all the time, and you're a little bit dizzy all the time, but then after a while you get over it because your joints are still working, oh, stop talking. Um, your joints are still working and your vision is okay, then you're still walking around. But then let's say you get a little bit of, um, um, you know, a cataract, or you've got diabetes and you can't see as well, or you've got diabetes and you've got mild nerve damage and you can't feel anymore. Then you start falling, 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 and you're like, why am I falling? What's wrong? Blah, blah. You know, you'll, you'll compensate till you decompensate, and that, that's hard for people to, you know, dad was fine until last week. Well, he wasn't really fine till last week, he was just compensating until something happened, he got a cold or he got, you know, had a little mini stroke or something and now he's not fine and so uh, Alzheimer's really can get exacerbated significantly by little tiny things, urinary tract infections, going, staying in a different location with a different child, moving locations, anything like that. Okay, last question. Last one, a hypothetical. Insurance probably wouldn't pay for it, but all these things we've been discussing, mm -hmm. different issues. If you had an MRI from your waist to your head, mm -hmm. wouldn't it address some of these things you're talking about? I'm sure it's going to pay for it, but... Um, a, good, a, good, so a good example of why to do things and why not to do things is probably the whole world of the prostate cancer screening. Mm -hmm. So prostate cancer screening. So the question is, is if you know... so. Theoretically, every single man over the age of 90 has prostate cancer to some degree. That's normal. So the question is how much and is that what you're going to die of? Most do not die of prostate cancer. It doesn't obstruct anywhere. It doesn't grow in the wrong place. It doesn't metastasize. It, like, it's, no, it, it's just what it is. So then the question is at what age do you start screening and how aggressive do you want to be? Because some of the interventions are not good. They, they can put radioactive like little, little, like, uh, little capsules in your prostate and it burns away some of the bad tissue, but you can have problems with holding your urine, you can have surgery, you can have all kinds of surgeries. Green you can have urinary incontinence. You, what was that? Green light laser. Green light laser. I'm sure that they're coming up with all kinds of good stuff, but the, the point is, is that you can intervene, you can cut out the whole prostate. But you can also be impotent and incontinent, well, and in pain, like and infection. So the quest, so what what medicine will do is we'll do studies over years, and we'll say, is it better? Like at what age do you start screening, and is the intervention worse than the problem? And as we come up with new treatments, it'll change the answers. So that's what's frustrating to lots of people because people are saying, you medicine people, you're constantly changing your opinion on stuff. Well, I hope so, because back in the day, in World War II, all we had was penicillin. That was the answer for everything. But now we've got all different, I mean, we are changing, like medicine is constantly changing, so the, the answers are changing all the time. So the question about whole body scanning is, is um, first of all, if you're gonna scan everybody, prop, uh, MRI is you know, two and a half, three times as expensive as a CAT scan. Um, what would you pick up and is, like, would you be causing more damage by intervening in things that would normally not be a thing? Like, would you find things and nodules and cysts? Because we got cysts in lots of different places, and most of them are benign. And um, so then are you going to start doing biopsies, and then you've got people going to the hospital, and they're nervous, and they get depressed, and 
Some commit suicide or some just get depressed or some get biopsies and then they get infections. Some get biopsies and then they have surgery and they take it out and oh, it's benign and then they get an infection so or they've got- worse than the disease. It may be. Yeah. Um, now, I think that CAT scanning on people who have a certain number of pack years of smoking, I think that that might be something that's happening in the future. I think that there is some discussion at what point you start doing some sort of baseline in x-ray or not, at what age, how many pack years. So that's a, that's a legit, I mean, just because right now it's not the standard of care, it doesn't mean it's not gonna be the standard of care in the future, because as we get better interventions and treatments, um, maybe it's better to find things out, you know? So everything's in flux all the time. That's my talk, gentlemen. We made it work for 45 minutes without any kind of thing. See you all later. Enjoy breakfast. Oh, no problem. Well, I guess we're going to...